A Parent Wins, An Adventure of a Lifetime, a global expedition dedicated to collecting stories of environmental and cultural preservation while conducting marine research aboard sailing vessel Resilience. We went to Alaska and we went to British Columbia you know, through Canada and we met with folks like Luis and, and Doug and, and uh, a bunch of other scientists and you know, fishermen and, and so on. And we were going there looking for help, really, looking for answers and looking for advice. And you know, we got to learn from these people that are extremely passionate and they're following that passion and using that passion to drive themselves to do incredible things. So we left Klimtu and we, we headed south. We stopped in a place called the Hakai Institute, which is an incredible facility that's been set up by a really generous couple that have taken an old fishing and hunting lodge and turned it into this research lab. The Hakai Institute is actually an outpost. It's only used seasonally. It's a place where scientists can comfortably stay and complete their research in the surrounding areas and they have all the necessary tools and laboratories. We saw a lot of people at Hakai. We just, there was so much to take in there. They're doing so much work. There are several different teams there all the time. But we had the opportunity to really sit down and get to know and meet with and hear from uh, Marcus and Alyssa. Marcus who does kelp research and then Alyssa who does uh, sea star research. My name is Marcus. I work with a number of organizations in British Columbia, including the Hakai Institute and the province and the BC Nature Trust and others to survey kelp. And we're, we have a large program right now with the Marine Plan Partnership to survey kelp with 15 different First Nations. These nations have um, been there for a long time. They have lots of local ecological knowledge about what those kelp beds looked like in the past. And Kelp beds are a really effective way to see how things are changing within the local ecosystem. A good analogy, I think, is kelp beds in the Pacific Northwest are an equivalent habitat to coral reefs in the south, where they're incredibly biodiverse. They're biodiversity hotbeds. They provide habitat for many different species, but kelp beds are also important to see changes in the environment. So they're very sensitive to changes in salinity, changes in temperature, and other changes in the environment, and changes in human activity. With climate change, we're concerned that these kelp beds may be impacted or disappear entirely. And there are cases further south, for example, in California, where large kelp beds have almost entirely disappeared over the past two to three years. In British Columbia, at many different locations, we've seen um, kelp beds decrease by 50 to 80 percent due to temperature and perhaps sea urchins. There's a lot of different kind of thoughts or hypotheses or schemes on how to mitigate changes. And uh, there's a lot of controversy right now over the carbon offsets, whether or not uh, kelp can actually sequester carbon. The question is, where does that kelp go? Does it stay within the local ecosystem and get eaten and then redistribute it back into the atmosphere? Or does it drift offshore and sink deep and get sequestered in the deep sediments? Um, and there's a lot of companies or organizations that, that are hoping that a lot of this kelp gets pulled out deep and sinks into the sediments. And there are some scientists who are saying that's not the case. So there's a lot of questions and um, a lot of controversy and a lot of push right now and it's uh, it's a really interesting time to be studying kelp I think. Kelp is really popular right now and so to talk to somebody that's very knowledgeable on kelp was eye-opening and it was a reminder that there's so much that we don't consider and so much that we don't know and how this whole idea of, of finding good answers for the problems that we have that we need to solve. Uh, we can't just rush to conclusions and think that one thing is going to be the saving grace. Hakai has so much going on, and we got to spend a lot of time with Marcus and learning from him and, and talking about kelp. But it's also really cool that on this island, where this facility is, there are so many different ecosystems. And walking down to the shoreline and getting to see some of that with Alyssa was pretty eye-opening. My name is Alyssa Gaiman. I'm a Hakai scientist. I work for the Nearshore team here, so I'm sort of have two main focuses. I work in the rocky intertidal, which is the 
I work with the animals and plants and algae that live between the low tide and the high tide in a day. And then the other focus is um, on sea stars in general, so just sea stars in any habitat that they're in. Sea stars are amazing, so they, they kind of don't look like they're doing much often to people who see them because they're sort of, especially if you see them in the inner tidal, they're really not moving, so they're just sitting there. But they're predators, they're voracious predators. Most importantly, they eat urchins. As you probably know, sea urchins are really important for determining whether you have kelp in an area or not. And um, especially here in the central coast, uh, the sunflower stars and otters um, both control urchin populations in a way that makes it so that you can have a kelp forest. In 2013, there was an outbreak of a wasting disease in sea stars. Um, it actually started in Washington, and it's a disease that causes sea stars to essentially melt away. They get lesions, their arms twist, and then their arms walk away, and then they dissolve. And it spread from Mexico up to Alaska, and it if we think it affects up to 20 species, but not evenly. So there's some that are really hard hit and some that are sort of mildly hit. The one that's the most hit is the sunflower star, and we lost over 90% of their population. Within the central BC coast is this area that has remnant populations. So, you know, when you lose 90% of a population, 10% is still somewhere, and some of them are here. And so we get to be the people who can look and see, well, why did they survive? What is it about the location? What is it about you know, the oceanography that might be determining where they are and why they're there? Alyssa and I went on a little adventure right before we were leaving. It was really cool because I got to see what she was talking about in action. Luckily, when we went there, we saw a whole bunch of ochre sea stars and there was only one or two sea stars that had the wasting disease that she was talking about. Like, I think sunflower stars might be part of why I started to be a marine biologist. Like, they're just cool. I don't know, I, like at the broader scale, I, I want a world where more people get to experience how cool nature is and like learn about it in a way that is interesting and engaging. You know, while we're up in Hakai in Alaska and having Alyssa, Alyssa talk about how, you know, she just hopes that more people can get in nature, it's just, I can't agree more. And we had the opportunity all the way down the coast between these stops and between meeting with people to anchor the boat off in, in a just completely uninhabited bay and go ashore, hike ashore, find mushrooms or or just kind of wander around and see what's out there. Usually have a little fire, you know, set up a little fire because it's just wet and cold everywhere. And sit by the fire and look at the stars and enjoy being out there. So we, we left Hakai Institute and we were heading our south, uh, retracing our path. Where are we going? Oh, we're going to Alert Bay. What's there? Which is uh, kind of like the most uh, settled island in this area and therefore where like the grocery is but also where the office is for, uh, for Jared's offices and Jared's a, a whale scientist, whale specialist and I believe Orca in particular and uh, so we're gonna go meet up with him if, uh, if we can't get him because he's out in the water because he said his schedule is dictated by whales and weather which is pretty cool. Uh, if we can't get him, then I'm hoping we can get a hold of Marcus and go out on his boat and go check out some kelp and whales. What's the haps with the whales? The haps with the whales is they've been around here longer than we really know and we're suspicious that they might have something going on that we need to know about, like some sort of plan. And the scientists have been doing research to figure out what their plans are. Like what? What's going on? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we're suspicious. <laughs> the orcas are up to something, we're trying to figure out what it is. And in Queen Charlotte Sound, just as you kind of enter it from the north, I heard these, this massive sort of group of islands um, that are just absolutely beautiful. And among those islands is Lert Bay. 
We had reached out to Jared Towers beforehand, just via email, totally cold, just looking up. We knew that that area was known for killer whales. Uh, we wanted to talk to scientists in the area about us. Actually ended up connecting with Jared via email, just saying, hey, I'm working with this group, we're doing filming, we'd love to talk to you. And he got back to us and, and was really receptive. My, uh, my main job is to keep track of the killer whales in Western Canada. So, so I think I probably recognize more, more dorsal fins than, than human faces, you know? Like, I think the thing with killer whales is that we relate to them so well. And the more we understand them, the better we relate to them. Uh, and it, it kind of stems back from these animals being so family orientated. And there's just interesting aspects of their, their life history that, um, that are unique in the animal kingdom. I mean, in resident killer whale society, you get um, different families within the population, and each family has its own uh, call type. And so not only to each other do they know who's calling, but even to us listening on our hydrophone networks, um, we can just pick up a, a group of whales calling a Johnson Strait or Blackfish Sound and, uh, and know who it is um, without looking at them. I spend a lot of time uh, photographing the killer whales, like spending a lot of time on the water with them. And so most of my winter, if I'm not down in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, on an expedition somewhere, I'm just in the office looking at photos, going through photos, scoring, annotating, and, and applying IDs, and then, and then s s like putting the data in different databases and trying to make sense of it all. But the whole point of the work is to just keep track of population abundance and trends. And, uh, and that's what we really are focused on considering their, um, their threatened populations are both of our killer whale populations, northern residents and bigs killer whales, are both uh, threatened under the Species at Risk Act in Canada. You know, whaling wasn't actually that long ago, and I don't think people realize because there's been a complete paradigm shift in the way that we view whales before they were viewed as a commodity, and now they're like these beautiful, sentient creatures. So when we share the planet with a population or a species that is rare, uh, we really need to be aware of how our actions impact the survival of that species or population. Uh, in many cases, killer whale populations are, are very culturally unique and also are made up of only a few individuals. For example, some killer whale populations only include 75 individuals or a couple hundred individuals and those populations don't intermingle with other killer whales. And so once they're gone, that culture is extinguished from this planet. A culture that has taken thousands of years to evolve. A language that has taken thousands of years to evolve. And, uh, and that's really important if we want to sustain uh, and protect all these other um, animals that we live on this planet with. The, the entire summer went by in a blur, and we, we learned so much, and you know, we were so inspired, and we are just still chewing on all that we had taken in, but we had to make it south. Uh, the weather was closing in, and then Jared Towers, he had called me a couple days after we left, uh, after interviewing him, and asked if we needed crew. And so he met us in Port Townsend and took off for San Francisco. Resilience it was our first time in the ocean for us, handled incredibly well did a whale survey the entire way down. It was blowing, but beautiful. And that passage down from, from Washington to San Francisco was just magic. It was one of those experiences that you can look back on for the rest of your life and just smile. Because, I don't know, everything about it was just perfect. Coming into California, we, uh, with Jared aboard, we were able to spot killer whales that have never been documented in that area. Uh, that was really cool. And then we came into San Francisco and we saw blue whales and definitely, you know, common dolphin, white-sided dolphin, humpback whales, a ton of birds, just all sorts of wildlife coming into San Francisco. And finally, we made it under that Golden Gate Bridge. And there's something so sweet about arriving into a place like that after a passage. Finally, Mexico is on the horizon.